Welcome everyone to my YouTube channel. Today I'm talking to Julian Simon, Chief Evangelist at Hugging Face. For those of you who don't have context what Hugging Face is, it's a company that was founded in 2016 and has become a robust AI community. Originally started as artificial BFF that you can chat with when your real friends aren't available. Six years later, Hugging Face is the leading NLP startup with millions of users that are taking their ML libraries into production. It has a vast open source community and is a hub for pre-trained deep learning models and served models. Originally focused on NLP, Hugging Face is also expanding to broader machine learning space, including computer vision and reinforcement learning. Julian and I today, we will be talking about transformer architecture, machine learning education, open source movement as such, and Hugging Face, its product, its mission, um, its role in, in the community. All right, so very excited to have you. Thank you for joining us today. For starters, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your career path. Chief Evangelist is a very exciting title. For those of the folks that are interested in becoming one, or do not know what it is about, I wanted to give them a little bit of a context um, of you know, how does one become an evangelist for the biggest AI community out there and what does that entail? Sure, and uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for having me today. Uh, apology for the, the raspy voice, but it's, uh, it's pretty cold and you know, I'm afraid my voice is, uh, is suffering from that. Um, <clears throat> so it's, um, it's an interesting question. I, I think it's, it was a, a combination of you know, luck and, uh, and more than anything else. Um, I started as a software engineer a century ago, then started managing teams. Um, becoming, uh, you know, CTO and a VP engineering in startups, started using the cloud and, um, and, you know, I saw AWS as something, uh, amazingly interesting and, uh, long story short, you know, I, I, I was a little tired of managing teams. Uh, I felt I was really repeating myself, uh, solving the same issues again and again, and I was looking for, uh, you know, I was looking to go back to an end zone uh, role, uh, and, uh, and of course I wanted to join AWS, but there wasn't so such a, an interesting technical role available there in France at the time. And, and they were pestering me about the, you know, oh, you would be a great evangelist. You would be a great evangelist. And, you know, I, I guess they convinced me, uh, maybe I would. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, so I joined them, uh, and that was my first experience in developer relations. And, uh, and you know, I, I feel, in, in fact, it's not so different from I was from what I was doing before because it's really um, interacting with the technical community from developers all the way to um, executives. And um, you know, the difference is you're you know you're not managing teams, you're not actually building and and, and delivering stuff. But you need to adapt very quickly. Every time you speak with a customer, you need to understand what the uh, how you can help them. Basically, you know, well, what's their current status? What are they trying to solve? Uh, can your uh, portfolio of solutions help them? And if yes, you know how to get started. So it's really problem solving. You know, listening to customers, and, and then problem solving with them, and then sh uh, building resources blogs, uh, demos, etc., that they can use to get started. So, um, so it's kind of like being a CTO in a way, <laughs> uh, except you don't have to, you know, babysit engineers, right? So that's pretty much my definition of, uh, of technical evangelism, but I guess everybody will have this, uh, their own definition. That's awesome. Um, so you just mentioned that you have, um, been working with AWS before. Um, and had um, other startup engagements. Yep. Um, and uh, so you, I, I know that you've spent some time uh, in the AWS ecosystem uh, in this cloud space. I was wondering whether you can sort of tell us how that impacted the way you're looking at the natural language processing space and sure. how it's evolving. Sure. And yeah, and the, the, the main reason why I got interested in the cloud is because it's just a faster way 
to build applications and it's a faster way to solve problems uh, versus, uh, you know, racking servers in data centers, which I've done for a while. It was fun, but, uh, you know, it stands in the way of getting to production quickly. And and I thought, okay, the cloud is, is, is pretty cool. So um, when it comes to machine learning, you know, I, um, I saw an opportunity, you know, to, again, to learn as AWS was launching some, some initial AI services in, uh, in 2016, um, I saw an opportunity to, first of all, to learn new stuff, which is very important to me. And it's critical in uh, any developer relations role, you know, make sure you stay current and, and learn every single day to help customers figure out what it is you're building. And I, so I saw an opportunity to build and I saw a, a really bad need for developer content because, you know, it's one thing to build those ML and AI services. It's another thing to, uh, for customers to adopt them. And if you're a machine learning expert, you know, if you have a machine learning PhD and all that good stuff, fine, you know, you don't need anybody, you'll, you'll figure it out. But if you're a, a normal developer like me, it's, um, you know, you need somebody to help you get started. And, you know, at the time, again, um, I felt that AWS was doing a, a really bad job at developer education and developer resources. So, you know, I just raised my hand and said, okay, you know, if no one wants to do it, I'm going to do it and I'm going to learn along, along the way, which I think is, is good because as I learn, I will hit some roadblocks and, uh, and the same roadblocks that everybody else will hit and I can build the, uh, the appropriate learning path and, and, and resources to uh, go around the roadblocks. And, um, you know, so it started up from out of curiosity, really curiosity and, um, and, you know, wanting to learn new stuff and then explaining it to people to make sure I understood it right and, uh, and, and to help them out. And, you know, I, I guess that worked. And, uh, and so, you know, gradually I got deeper and deeper into uh, deep learning, pun not intended. And, you know, I keep um, exploring all the time and, um, but always with a focus to solve problems, you know, I'm, like the, the science, the hard science part of it, I'm not very interested in because first, you know, my brain is not wired for it. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some very bright people doing that, so they don't need me at all. Um, but I think what's really needed is to turn those very complicated models into, uh, into something that, uh, you know, any developer and any business can use. So you know, that's, that's where I focus. I try to be super pragmatic. And the combination with cloud infrastructure to me is very obvious because, you know, you, you, machine learning is a very spiky workload. You need lots of compute power to train and then you don't need it at all. And you need to scale your inference uh, infrastructure as well. So, I mean, cloud and machine learning go very well together. I know there are a lot of people doing on-prem and, you know, fine if it works for them. But uh, for the majority of people, I think cloud is the way to go. So, you know, it's a good combination for me. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, on on the note of these uh, complicated models that you're working with, uh, primarily it looks like you're working with transformers. Transformers um, exploded a couple of years ago once they got published um, as a result of research. And so I was wondering, in terms of like your take on the on the transformers as a person that is primarily interested in building with them. Um, yeah. why do you, why do you think they are so successful and so, um, sort of applicable? Why that, why there are like many variations of them and they just keep, uh, iterating. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, you know, and, and again, coming back to when I got started with deep learning around 2016, of course, you know, once you work your way through the, you know, the, the toy examples and, uh, you know, the simple, uh, fully connected network and the simple convolution network and, and the MNIST example and all that stuff, you know, fine, you know, where do you go next? You know, and let's say you want to do, I don't know, translate machine translation, or you want to do uh, text classification, or you want to do image recognition, but you know, not MNIST uh, numbers or complex images. Then all, the, all of a sudden things became very complicated because, um, you know, writing your own TensorFlow model from scratch or writing your own PyTorch model from scratch is just something that 99.9% .9 of people just cannot do. 
Um, and and there was a very limited selection of um, off the shelf models, right? So yeah, you could grab ResNet and you could grab uh, a couple more. I mean, there are there were a few, especially for image uh, workloads. But if you wanted to do you know even NLP, you couldn't pick up uh, a lot of models out there. And if you were looking for non English languages, then you know you were doomed. So I think at the end of the day, that's why transformers are so successful. It's, it's because they, uh, you know, they, over time, the, the, the standard architecture of transformers has, has led to a ton of pre-trained models that are uh, hosted on Hugging Face. And so now in minutes, you can go and grab a model that's, uh, you know, pre-trained on a ton of data, which is something that would take maybe weeks or months for you to do on your own, um, and maybe with not so great results. And, uh, and you can load the model and you can test it on your data in, 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 in minutes, literally minutes, and see if that works for you or not. And, uh, and thanks to our community, you know, we have tens of thousands of models for lots of different task types and not just NLP, but computer vision and speech and reinforcement learning. And, you know, we have time series now uh, coming up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they support tons of different languages and, you know, tons of different data sets. So chances are, you know, compared to five, six years ago, where I would have to go and, and, and look for, you know, whatever repository uh, on GitHub with maybe a model I could use, uh, and then go and look for a data set that I could train it on and, and then actually try to train it on that data set, you know, that could easily take a week to get very mediocre results. Um, and, um, and now, you know, in minutes, I can go to the hub, find a model that works. And again, maybe it's just good enough to go to production directly. Maybe I don't even need to tune it, right, to fine tune it. And I think that's, uh, to me, that's that simplicity, that ease of use that really speeds up projects. And, uh, and, you know, for developers who just want to get the job done, it's a very interesting proposition. Just go fast, test models, go fast, find one you like, deploy it, and, and you're done, right? Um, so uh, to me, that's the key thing. All right. And uh, so there are so many transformer-based models in your yeah. Hugging Face library at the moment. Um, quick personal question. Do you have a favorite one? <laughs> Uh, it changed. I think it changes every week. Um, I think it would be very tempting to say, oh, you know, all the stable diffusion stuff, the text of to image stuff, that's crazy. Yeah, it's fun. But again, um, I'm really about using machine learning to solve real life problems. Uh, you know, a bit of fun is nice, but you know, I, I want to, I want to get things done. So I think we, we have some, um, uh, amazing models, for example, for uh, um, speech to text. Um, there's one that I really like. I, I show it all the time. It's one. It's it's based on the Wave Two Vec Two architecture. It's a Facebook model, or I should say Meta, and uh, it it does speech to text and built-in translation from 21 languages to English. Right. So you could speak in any of 21 languages, and the model outputs an English uh, sentence that you can use for, I don't know, search or whatever. Uh, I think speech is, is very interesting because it's the natural uh, human interface, right? It's what we do. Uh, typing is just, you know, is it, just uh, not as good. We need to speak. So I think all the voice applications are important. And, and so the speech to text models are important and I'm just amazed how good they are. And, you know, the, the whisper model from open AI is very good too. So I think these are probably my favorite right now. That's super cool. Um, I, I definitely share your, um, take on being interested in what one can do with these models, uh, rather than, you know, how elaborate, how, um, sophisticated they are. Um, and so. I think we can we can already start seeing a class of very new types of products and companies built on top of these models. Um, mm -hmm. I am wondering about your perspective on this. What kind of models do you see? Uh, sorry, what kind of products do you see that are built on top of transformers out there? And um, sort of like the follow follow up question would be, 
where do you see they are bringing the most, um, I guess, like business utility value at the yeah. moment? Well, you know, it's. I, I'll start with the second question because I think it's it's really to me again the, the most important thing. Um, you know, all the customers I talk to, they 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 fit in one of three categories, right? So, option one, they really want to build, they want to innovate. Okay, they want to build a user experience that has never existed before, and they think machine learning is the only way they can deliver it. Okay, but to be honest. Uh, it's it's probably the minority of customers. Uh, the, the 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 vast majorities a majority of customers, they even want they either want to make money with machine learning, right? So accelerate their business, um, you know, provide a better recommendation engine, whatever, you know, increase click click through rates, or and that's option two. Or and option three is they want to save money. Okay, they want to automate manual processes. They want to replace legacy applications um, that don't work so well anymore uh, with something smarter. So at the end of the day, that's it. You know, it's great UX, save money, make money, right? And so, um, so that means you're gonna find uh, you're gonna find opportunities for machine learning everywhere, right? Because every business app. Uh, can be improved to be more, uh, you know, more innovative or more profitable or faster or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, when you look at the business workflows in, in, in companies today, you know, there are still manual steps. Um, there are still legacy apps with, uh, you know, antique business rules that mean nothing anymore. Um, and of course there's innovation that can happen everywhere. So, um, uh, the, the, the typical customer for machine learning is every company. Uh, I think it's, it would be very easy to think, oh, you know, unless you're Google or Facebook or, or Amazon or um, Microsoft or et cetera, or Netflix or Spotify, you know, you can't really do machine learning in a great way and it's not going to deliver amazing benefits. But it's completely wrong. I mean, even simple use cases like, uh, you know, automatically classifying incoming customer emails or or support phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's, you know, with machine learning, you can do it 10 times faster, maybe a hundred times faster. And so, you know, you, your company, your workflows become more efficient, um, probably more profitable, and, and you deliver a better experience to your customers. So it's, it's literally, you know, it's literally everywhere. I think um, uh, in the, the, the problem, of course, is it needs to be simple enough and accessible enough that uh, your average company can deploy models in their apps without having to build a 20 people data science team um, because they'll never, you know, they'll never be able to. Uh, they'll never be able to hire those folks and pay them and keep them happy and it shouldn't be needed anyway, right? Um, so I think it's really the key here. It's, uh, it's for everyone, but in order for machine learning to be for everyone, we need to make it simpler uh, and uh, and fast, just like software engineering, right? It should be the same. And and I think that's really what Hawking Face is trying to do. Gotcha. And so um, you mentioned all these, um, these benefits coming from using transformer models. Um, I'm wondering if one should know of any trade-offs when, when using them. What would you say to that? Well, there's an obvious one that I think uh, some people forget is, you know, they, they're big models, right? So um, if you, um, you're going to need uh, a bit of infrastructure to predict with them, and, uh, and if you need uh, low latency models, that can be a challenge. Again, Hugging Face is trying to help. Um, we have specific libraries for that. Um, but they're big models. They take um, a bit of time to train, et cetera, et cetera. And... You know, sometimes, honestly, maybe you can you can rely on simpler algorithms and uh, and statistical algorithms, um, or just non-machine learning solutions to get the job done. So, you know, I think we, we shouldn't get uh, too high on on our own supply. Sometimes, you know, transformers are overkill for the problem you want to solve. Maybe a simple CNN or a simple LSTM or or even a simple XJBoost model will work. 
Um, and uh, it's very tempting to always play with the latest and greatest toys. But again, from a business perspective, simple is always best. And so uh, you don't have to use transformers all the time. Um, you have to use them when they make most sense. Um, so I think that's the, that's the, my, my number one advice. And number two, I guess, is a, a general uh, um, remark on, on deep running models. They're complex models. They're, it's not easy to understand how they work. Uh, it's not easy to, under, to explain how they predict. And for some companies, you know, for regulated companies, it's difficult to deploy those models in production because they, they can't really explain what the models, uh, how the models predict and how they came up with a particular result, which they have to explain by law or, or regulation. So I think we need also to work on, you know, explainability and, uh, and building more trust in, in models behaving um, in, in the expected way. So. Lots of research in coming years, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, yeah, I mean the the space is evolving super far, fast in terms of the research, especially. And so um, I'm curious, being an educator in the space um, and and trying to focus on the most important technologies that are out there to share them with the folks that are trying to build something with it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? How do you sort of keep up with this explosive progress in the machine learning space right uh, now? And, and what do you think it's worth keeping up with? Because I guess not yeah, everything uh, is here. The honest answer is I don't keep up. And I don't think anyone can keep up. Um, you know, you, you have to be... Uh, it's one thing, you know, to retweet the latest and greatest model and, and the latest and greatest you know, insane new ML demo uh, or put it on LinkedIn and fine, you know, fine, fine, you know, build your profile, build your brand, you know, who am I to, uh, to tell you not to do that? But I think it's a different thing to really understand what this is about. And, uh, and again, I, I try to focus on, um, you know, I try to focus 80% of my time on, on what's really useful for customers out there. And, uh, and of course, you know, again, there's a ton of excitement about stable diffusion and all the fun stuff, but uh, is it, is it the number one use case and the number one problem that companies want to solve with deep learning these days? Honestly, you know, I don't see it. <laughs> Maybe I talk to the wrong folks. So it's great, you know, don't get me wrong. It's great. We see those, those models. It's great to see all the progress. It's exciting. I'm sure there will be some, some super amazing, uh, business use cases for it, but you know, a lot of people, what they really want to do is they have a mountain of PDF files and they want to, uh, extract the text and the entities from that stuff. And they want to summarize them and translate them, or they want to do real time analytics on, uh, on customer phone calls, etc. I mean, these are the real life problems out there. So I'm trying to focus on that. And, uh, because I know when I speak with customers, that's the questions. These are the questions I'm going to get, you know, um, how do you do X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z is not going to be something insanely crazy and sexy. It's going to be a business workflow that needs to be improved. Um, so. Again, you know, it's, it's about timing. I think it's, uh, you need to keep an eye on the bleeding edge stuff, but you need to be aware that the bleeding edge stuff, uh, like the latest and greatest PyTorch version, you know, PyTorch 2.0 came out. I, I haven't looked at it, uh, yet, uh, because I know, uh, you know, a lot of customers are probably still stuck with PyTorch 1.10 and PyTorch 1.11 and, uh, and that's fine. They can get the job done. Um, because production environments are not going to move as fast as open source projects, et cetera, et cetera. And you, know, you can say the same about everything. I mean, it's, uh, um, there's the, you know, the bubbling, uh, uh foaming excitement, uh, in, in open source and on Twitter and LinkedIn and, uh, Acker news everywhere else. And then there's the dirty, nasty reality of enterprise it and you know, uh, that's, that's where I focus because that's where customers are. Mm -hmm. Doing the legwork, <laughs> exactly. Ma making sure that the, the, uh, latest and greatest of models are actually, 
uh, coming from the pedestal and uh, yeah, they, they being used in the production. You know, they will get there, but um, you know the, the 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 models from two years ago are probably you know uh, what people are using these days. I mean, a lot of folks still use Bert, and it's uh, it's five six years old now. Um, so you know they because getting that stuff in production is already difficult. So you can't expect that customers will uh, deploy a new model every week or. You know, they need to test it. They need to build trust in it. They need to get it through their um, uh, compliance teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, again, the bleeding edge is fine, but the bleeding edge is not where companies are. And um, and they shouldn't be because it's just too risky and too, uh, you know, unfamiliar technology to, to use on a daily basis. So you need to be more conservative. And, you know, I, I say all the time, I'm trying to do machine learning boring. You know, um, just like, uh, you know, MySQL and Postgres are boring mm -hmm. um, because boring technology is, is technology that you understand and, and you, you, you trust it and, and you know how it works and you know how it breaks and, and you can't be using the latest and greatest thing all the time. That's honestly a common mistake for developer advocates, by the way, uh, always pushing the, you know, the latest and greatest thing. And um, and your customers are still using the version of the release from two years ago because it's stable and it's just fine. So, um, you know, be be very very aware and, and and respectful of the constraint that customers have and learn that stuff. Focus on that because that's where you're going to help them most. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, thank you for this. So um, I wanted to ask you also about um, sort of. My observation that being in this space, I feel like people often shy away from machine learning, both in terms of the business utility, but also um, as individuals in terms of sort of like grasping what it is about and what how useful it could be uh, for their purposes. And uh, I don't have machine learning background. You don't have like per se machine, but machine learning background in in terms of the education. Um, and so I am curious about your perspective of how much of the A background, I guess we would have to define it as well, but like how, how much of that stuff one does need to understand in order to start building? Are there any particular things that they need to have in mind or is it sort of like irrelevant at this point because it became so easy to build with these models? Well, uh, honestly, again, I'm trying to make it as irrelevant as I can. Um, I think the... And the reason for that is because machine learning is so so powerful and and it's so important and you know I believe it can have such a positive impact for companies and for society in general that we need to we need it to be a basic skill for every developer, right? I mean, some of you listening to us today, you know, you write code in Python. Some of you, you, you know, JS, some of you know, use Java or C++. That's okay. Fine. You, it's not about the language, you know, but, um, you also probably all know, you know, some SQL and, and you probably all know how to work with, uh, you know, no SQL, uh, backends, whatever they are. And, uh, and you probably all know a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, web programming, uh, et cetera. So what I, what I really want, you know, what I really encourage everybody to do is that machine learning should be part of that skill portfolio. Okay. And not because it's going to look good on the resume, you know, let's not even get there. It's because machine learning is getting to this point where you have off the shelf solutions, you know, you have cloud AI services from your favorite cloud vendors. Um, you have um, off the shelf models on Hugging Face, which you can very easily deploy as well. And these are just waiting for you to, uh, to, to test them and add them to your apps, okay? And of course, you need to understand the, you know, the, the, the benefits and, and some of the challenges of machine learning. Um, you need to understand the importance of testing extensively on your own data. You need to, you know, you need to understand what the machine learning metrics mean. What does accuracy really mean, you know, for a, for a classification problem, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't need a machine learning PhD for that. 
you know, you need you need a brain, and all of you out there have that, and a better a better one than mine <laughs> for sure, a younger one. So you can learn that stuff, you know, um, and don't let anybody let tell you that you need to go through algebra and. Uh, and 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 equations it infuriates me every time i see somebody on linkedin posting the the the, the 60 page pdf file with the math you need for deep learning you know no 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 that's the math you need to to build new machine learning models right like invent new ones or dive deep into models to debug them you know understand why they're why they're working the way they are or not working the way they are. But it keeps, you know, reinforcing this perception that, oh, you know, if I don't know, you know, matrices and eigenvalues, and, you know, I can't get into machine learning. And that's not true, okay? And I'll take this one to the grave. Uh, you'll hear me saying that for as long as I breathe. It's not true. Um, you don't, it's, it's the same when I was younger, you know, it was like, oh, you need to be really good at math if you want to write software. You know, my teacher would tell me that in high school and, and everybody would repeat it. And I was like, okay, give me an example, you know, give me an example of why I need to be good at math to, to, to write software. And I was good at math, you know, um, but I've been in this industry for about 30 years, um, and I guess the only time I needed a bit of math when I, is when I actually started diving into, you know, convolution and uh, and some of the and the optimization process for deep learning models. I mean, I've I've had a reasonably good career without doing any math for 25 years, so we're getting to the point where it's the same for ML. So don't listen to the bullshit. Excuse my French and see machine learning and deep learning as another tool that you need to have in your skill set and start experimenting okay and educate yourself and again what's a model how does it work what are the metrics what do they mean but it's strictly a black box thing okay and then put it in your test app and evaluate it but you know and if you get to a point where you have complex issues and you need expert advice, then you'll go and find a data scientist in your company or a friend or whoever, and they will dive into the model and fix it or, you know, tune it or whatever they need to do. But I mean, we all write SQL, right? Do we all understand how a relational database works? Do you understand? In, can you explain to me in a hardcore detail how indexing and, and, and query optimization works? No. And do you need to? No. Okay, because the technology works and it's mature. And machine learning is slowly getting there, and so we need to have that same mindset. Um, that's awesome, and I think a like, big part of uh, the work that you're doing, uh, as we had a, I, I had the pleasure talking with you before, is uh, focused on making the ML sound more like uh, software engineering rather than um, a complex, complex math and complex science that's um, dedicated to only a few. Um, exactly. I want, yeah, I wanted to um, sort of ask you about Hugging Face community as it is right now. Um, first of all, I am a big fan of your community. It's, uh, I, I'm part of the community as well, playing with, uh, with the models that are available there. Um, and uh, so it's this super active bunch of folks that are, um, you know, pushing the open source to its limits. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to um, ask you about sort of the makeup of people that are sort of contributing to the community and uh, also about your perhaps views or maybe an explanation of how did it become so active and awesome? <laughs> Well, you know, just like everything else, I mean, Hugging Face started very small and um, and then, you know, it grew exponentially. And to me, um, the number one reason for that is because the, the libraries, the open source libraries are solving a really complex problem for a lot of people out there. And I was one of them, you know, when Google Bird came up, I was so excited. It's like, oh yeah, okay, Transformers sounds good. Let's go and try it. You know, twenty late twenty seventeen, early twenty eighteen. Don't remember. 
and and I went to the GitHub repo, and they had the weight, the you know the model weights, the files in the repo, and they had a, a, a I guess a couple of fine tuning scripts that I couldn't understand really, and very little documentation. It's like amazingly frustrating for me because there's this bit of revolutionary technology. You know, looking at the benchmarks, it was revolutionary, and yet. Um, you know, I couldn't do anything with it, you know? So how do I fine tune it? How do I, you know, and what's fine tuning anyway? And why do I need to do that? And how do I deploy it? You know, how do I put it in production to test it? And and then, of course, the thousands of follow-up follow models came up. And I think the Transformers library just made it easy to write one line of Python code and load a model and then one line of Python code with the pipeline API and predict with the same model. Job done, right? Exactly what I was saying before. Do I need to understand, you know, even what a tokenizer does? Um, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to my colleagues out there. Um, as, as a developer, as an application builder, I don't need to understand what a tokenizer does. I, I want to pass some data, I want to see it predicted, and I want to see that the prediction is correct. And sure, you know, maybe later I want to dive deeper and understand what tokenization means, and okay, fair enough. Uh, but it's 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 hidden, right? And I think that's why Hugging Face just exploded, because it made possible made it possible for literally everybody knowing Python to work with state-of-the-art models with super simple APIs, and the API is consistent. And so you have new models coming up every day, every day, every day, amazing new ones. And you can still load them in one line of code and, and deploy them in one line of code. And and to me, these are the greatest tools, the tools that don't stand in the way, the tools that are, I, I hardly need to learn. You know, I just read the doc for 10 minutes and I know what, I know the basic operations. And uh, so I think the simplicity is, is always key. And, uh, and, you know, the open source model will bring your uh, will will encourage your users to send you you know issues and pull requests and then uh, of course you know researchers people inventing those great models as your community grows they want to make sure the community gets access to that so um, so you know a few weeks back Google released a, a, a really great new model and uh, and I think the paper was published and three hours later the model was on the hub uh, because, you know, that's where the the attention is, that's where the traction is, that's where the community is. So it, it's it's great to publish a paper, but it's even better if your model is readily available on, on Hugging Face and everybody can start using it. And you see, you know, thousands and thousands of downloads on the on the very first day. And, and great. I mean, that's why you build those models. You want people to use them. Um, and I think, you know, it's... it's uh, it's a snowball effect, and uh, and we're very, very, you know, um, respectful and, and thankful uh, to, to the community because that they make us successful. Uh, from you know, I would say normal users like me <laughs> to uh, uh, to researchers contributing models, and uh, and we have a developer relations team who's doing an amazing job at uh, explaining um, in simple terms what those models are and and you know I really encourage you to check out the the, the hugging face course and uh, and the blog posts etc they, they do a really good job at that at making it simple to to understand and I think one last thing is uh, we're a remote first company and um, and you know uh, we have uh, folks I'm not gonna say all over the world but uh, yeah I mean we have teams uh, in the US and in Europe and uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, etc. It's it's a little bit distributed everywhere. And so this creates even more com um, opportunities to engage with the local communities, right? I mean, if we have an engineer uh, on, on the West Coast, then fine, you know, uh, they can go and do meetups over there. And if we have an engineer in Switzerland, they can go and do that. And if we have, uh, you know, engineers in uh, Anywhere, you know, in the Nordics, they can go and do that. So, so I think the, the distributed community uh, is, um, is important as well. The distributed company uh, helps building a distributed community. Yeah, it's, it seems like these days open sourcing 
your technology, open sourcing the model is one of the most powerful ways to ensure that there is like a wide adoption and super fast adoption. Um, case of stable diffusion is, is one. Uh, I am curious about your views on the open source versus proprietary models. So um, stable diffusion is a, is a great success story for the open source model, but uh, we also have recently Chat GPT, where uh, you know a company, OpenAI, is working on the model internally and then also only releases it for access to um, folks, not necessarily to build with it, but but to interact with it. And um, do you think these two models can coexist, or is is there, or being also an open source, you know, promoter, do you think it's it's the only way forward? You know, I mean, I think it's. Um, you, you have to see it from both sides, right? I think on the open source side, research and, and particularly machine learning has always been very open. You know, it's uh, there's a there's a lot of publications, there's a lot of open source libraries, models are being shared, and I think that's one of the reasons why we see so much innovation because a lot of the research is in the open, and uh, and then of course you know things snowball and and. And you know, there's there's a challenge for researchers to go always further and further, and that's fine. That's great. We we need to have that. Um, but on the other side, you know, it, it would be very easy to say, oh, all the commercial stuff, it's evil, etc. But honestly, you know, I wouldn't have worked at AWS for six years if if I thought that was the case. And um, and you know, those companies, they you know, they also invest a lot of money, right? Uh, I mean, training. Training those models, building those data sets, um, uh, it, it's, you know, it's an expensive proposition. So it's, it's reasonable to expect that, you know, they make a very big investment and they want to make money um, at the end of the day. You know, it's, it's how the world works. So if you, if you disagree with that, then fine. Uh, you have a, a choice to use only open source solutions, 100%. And again, hugging face is making it possible. But sometimes, you know, innovation uh, also happens in, uh, you know, in private labs and, and private companies. And they, uh, you know, ultimately they decide what they want to do with it. Um, I think a few years ago, I was probably more pessimistic than I am now. Uh, uh, we saw, for example, you know, Dali Mini being closed and, uh, and of course GPT-3 being closed for a long time. That's, that kind of led the open source community to the big science project and the Bloom model, which is the, an open alternative to GPT-3. And, and of course, uh, you know, stable diffusion is, is more and more accessible now than uh, DALI Mini was, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, you know, we need to find a balance. I think we need to find a balance between, you know, uh, commercial research, commercial applications, commercial investments and, uh, and open source, you know, trying to, you know, maybe come up with open answers to that. And if that's not possible, you know, just have a dialogue with those companies and, uh, and help them understand that, you know, no real adoption will, uh, will happen if, uh, if everything is just a black box with an API on top of it. Um, and, you know, again, we've seen OpenAI and others opening their models a little more than they used to. So we've seen Facebook sharing a ton of amazing large models. Uh, Google is doing that as well. And, you know, I'm pretty sure they also have their own closed models that they're not sharing. And it's their freedom to do that. So uh, I think the community now is, is powerful enough that it, you know, it, it it won't be, you know, such a threat. I mean, those... those um, world garden models, they shouldn't be such a threat. Uh, but they're fascinating, you know. Uh, GitHub Copilot is another one, you know, I'm very impressed. I think we, we discussed it the last time around. Um, very impressed with GitHub Copilot. And, uh, you know, we launched an effort called Big Code. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I'm pretty sure Big Code will get to uh, to the same point as Big Science did, you know, building open alternatives to, to commercial models. But then again, you know, lots of developers out there are just happy to use GitHub uh, Copilot and, and that's fine, you know, freedom of choice. So if you want to do open source only, do that. If you want 
a mix of commercial solutions because they work maybe out of the box with zero integration, etc. Fine. Um, it's you know we need to have a balance between the two. It's uh, you know it's it's not black and white. Mm, yeah, I think I think it's a great point that um, I I don't see why the two paradigms cannot coexist together. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's so much progress in the space that necessarily there will be like different types of companies and models um, built with the with the use of of um, this technology. So um, speaking of which, I kind of know the answer to this, but I'm also um, sort of conscious of the fact that whenever somebody encounters Hugging Face and hears about its open source technology, the question that, that arises very often is how do you actually make money? How do you sustain yourself as a, as a business, as an organization? So the first thing is that, um, you know, the hub and the open source libraries will stay free, you know, forever. Um, so if anything is concerned, if anybody is concerned that some at somebody will wake up one morning and decide uh, we're closing the hub, we're closing the libraries, we're restricting innovation there, um, you know, it's it's not going to happen um, anywhere soon, anytime soon. But obviously, yeah, um, you know, um, hosting uh, hosting the hub serving the model downloads we serve way more than 1 million downloads every day i mean you can imagine you know we have infrastructure costs and you know we have employees and we need to pay them as well so uh, um you know sometimes i meet people saying ah you know open source should never be commercial and it's like well my friend then explain to me how you build uh you know how you build a hub um with a, with a free infrastructure bill and how you find you know, 150 experts in machine learning, which is the size of Hugging Face today, and that agree to work for free, you know, full time. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a kind of an ideological stance. And, uh, you know, I don't care for that. Um, I don't think politics have anything in, to do in open source. So if you want to work for free, go work for free. That's That's your own thing. But as a commercial company with costs, we need to make money. So um, we have a number of uh, ways to do that. So first of all, we have commercial services. For example, a few, uh, couple of months ago, we launched inference endpoints, which, uh, you know, which is a really cool way to host your models on AWS and Azure with auto scaling and security and, and all the good stuff you expect. And so we have paying customers for that. Uh, we have um, um, commercial spaces. If you, you know, spaces are free, but if you want, uh, you know, to scale your spaces, if you want GPU acceleration, etc., that's a, that's a commercial option. Uh, we have an AutoML service called AutoTrain. Again, uh, there's a free tier, but if you want to scale things, it's it's a paying service. Uh, then, of course, we do uh, we do uh, consulting for for a lot of companies. Because you know, skills transformer skills are very rare, and companies want to move fast and adopt transformers in the best possible way, get to production fast. So uh, we we use all our uh, internal knowledge to help those customers deliver high quality solutions, and of course that's that's a commercial service. Um, and then we have partnerships. Um, you know, we have partnerships with uh, AWS. We have partnerships with uh, Azure. Uh, we have partnerships with uh, hardware vendors for hardware accelerations, company like, you know, Intel, uh, Habana, uh, Graphcore, etc., uh, to co to work together on hardware acceleration for transformers, etc., uh, etc. Et so, you know, we we, um, we draw the line at, I would say, production. Anything that's educational, uh, you know, dev and test, small scale, you can do on Hugging Face for free, including deployment. But when, you know, the scale and the complexity increases, then it means you have yourself a commercial use case. And if you have a commercial use case, then it's fair that Hugging Face gets some revenue for it. And that's pretty much where we draw the line. But from the individual developer perspective, um, you know, it's all free. You can do you can do all of it for free, uh, from you know training to uh, auto training to deployment to using spaces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Uh, and that's going to be that way for a long, long time. Awesome. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for painting the picture. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the things on Hagen Pace roadmap moving forward? Oh, well, we have a very, it's a very moving, it's, it's a fast moving target. Uh, you know, we experiment a lot. Um, I think we're, um, you know, we're really focusing on still on adoption. Uh, you know, you could think, oh yeah, hugging face, you have a lot of users, so adoption is not so important. But in my opinion, we have very good adoption from researchers and data scientists and machine learning engineers. But, you know, to me, it's really 1%, right? It's 1% of the technical community. So I want to go after everyone, everybody else. I want to go after the developers, you know? I saw a study saying you have about maybe 200, 3,000, 200,000 uh, or 300,000 machine learning specialists in the world, whatever that means. But you have probably about 25 million developers. So like I said, we're probably only speaking with 1% of, uh, of, uh, of our potential users. So again, I think it's all about, you know, all, we need to keep doing a great job at open source. We need to keep adding all those amazing models, um, make them simple to use, like we've done with the diffusers library where, uh, you know, you work with the stable diffusion models just as easily as the other transformer models um, in, in the transformers library. So um, that simplicity is central to, uh, to hugging face. So we'll keep doing that. We'll keep expanding our use cases. Like I said, you know, uh, uh, we're expanding the, the use cases. We started with NLP and now we have much more than that, including time series. Um, and on the commercial side, you know, we'll see what are the pain points? You know, what's the, what, what are the main problems that customers want to solve? So deployment, model deployment, model scaling, model optimization, are still very important concerns. And I would think as those models get bigger and bigger, you know, the concern will get bigger. I think, you know, if you're trying to deploy distilled BERT, you know, okay, we know how to do that. We know how to optimize it, fine. But how do you deploy stable diffusions? How do you deploy those huge language models? And how do you make them fast? And how do you operate them in production? I think these are very interesting questions and that are going to become um, more and more important as those models come go from research to dev and test to actual production. So we'll probably, uh, you know, we'll probably try to have some good answers there. Amazing. I'm really excited about the future of Hugging Face um, and uh, I wish you good speed on, on the mission to broadening the adoption. Thank you so much, Julian, for sitting down with me. It's been an absolute pleasure to sure. have you here. And uh, take care. Thank you very much.